All right. Welcome everyone to this webinar on marine and coastal biodiversity and indicators for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. This is part of a series of webinars convened by CBD Secretariat in the lead up for the forthcoming resume sessions of SOFTA 24, SBI 3, and the third meeting of the open-ended working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. As the chair of SOFSA, it is my pleasure to co-host and chair this webinar, and also to co-host a number of other forthcoming webinars. Please check the CBD site for more information on the full webinar series. As the outset, I wish to emphasize a few key points about these webinars. First, this webinar is focusing only on the marine and coastal biodiversity aspects of the monitoring framework for the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. Other broader aspects in the indicators and monitoring framework will be discussed in the forthcoming webinars, in particular on the 25th and 27th of January. Second, these webinars will not address the issues to be discussed on the agenda item six of SOFSTA on marine and coastal biodiversity, namely conservation and sustainable use of marine and coastal biodiversity document CRP2 or ecologically or biologically significant marine areas document CRP4. So I repeat, we will not address these issues. Colleagues, the importance of monitoring progress towards our global goals and targets cannot be understated. Indicators are essential to telling us how we are doing in our efforts to achieve our goals, whether our management actions are having the desired impact and if we need to change course. However, indicators can only be effectively play it's this role if they are well formulated and respond to the elements of the goals and targets and if the right information is available as input for the indicators discussions are ongoing under the cbd regarding the formulation of the indicators but we also need to make sure that we can actually have information available to report against them this becomes especially challenging in ocean and coastal areas with a wide range of ecosystem types and human uses and significant data gaps in many parts of the ocean. A key strength that we can rely on is the fact that there are many international processes and initiatives that already produce and manage information that can also help to address indicators for the post 2020 framework. This includes a number of processes that governments already report to. In these webinars, we will discuss various opportunities, challenges, and gaps in applying the draft post 2020 indicators in marine and coastal areas and various sources of information that can help parties to respond to these indicators. Now, I invite the CVD Secretariat to give us an introduction to this webinar and also to explain the functions of, of this webinar platform. So, Secretariat, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so, I hope that you can see my screen. Um, as Suzuki just mentioned, this is part of a, a series of webinars. The first webinar was actually held on the 13th of January. Um, I am hoping that I'm just showing now the list of the webinars that we have planned uh, over the next month and a half or so. Um, so there will be additional webinars next week, which cover the, the monitoring framework um, as a whole, uh, and also an additional webinar next week, which is looking at the 
a scientific basis for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework that is led by its presenting work that was led by the scientific community. Um, so I'm going to stop that now. So uh, I would like to welcome everyone this morning to this webinar. As you may be aware, we are currently in the process of um, trying to finalize a monitoring framework for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Currently, the draft monitoring framework includes three different levels of indicators. Um, it includes headline indicators, which are being recommended for national reporting. It includes component indicators, which provide additional detail that the countries may need in order to make sure that they capture the different aspects of the of the goals and targets, and then it includes complementary indicators, which may be useful for thematic analysis or more specialized analysis. Um, and so this all is a package which will be used for both national and global monitoring um, of the, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. In order to ensure that we bring the marine and coastal biodiversity elements into this monitoring framework in an appropriate way, uh, the Secretariat worked with members of the marine and coastal scientific community in order to, to draft the document that's going to be presented today. Um, and this document outlines not only what could be monitored at this headline level, which I just mentioned, but how do you capture marine and coastal biodiversity across the, the whole framework, um, the whole monitoring framework in a way that, that would be useful. And, and the paper doesn't provide information really on which level these indicators should be at. So as we're leading up to SAPSTA, there's a lot of focus on negotiating um, which indicators will be the, the headline level of indicators. Whereas today we're sort of looking more broadly across the scope of of how do you how do you measure the marine and coastal environment in a way that makes sense and and, and then that can inform the discussions that will happen at SAPSTA um, in the next few months on uh, where these indicators would actually come up into the monitoring framework. And, and so I hope that this is useful for everyone. And the monitoring, the draft monitoring framework is currently online as a non-paper for SAPSTA. For SAPSTA, 24 um, and you can find that as a non-paper there and this information document that i mentioned uh, which is going to be uh, included in the presentations today is also online for that same sapsta meeting um joe over to you thanks thanks so much jillian uh hello again uh, everyone my name is Joe Appiat. I am the uh, coordinator of the work on marine, coastal, and island biodiversity. Uh, greetings from uh, from Canada. Um, apologies if you hear some humming in the background. Um, our lifestyle in Canada means that we had a negative 40, negative 30 temperatures recently. A, a pipe burst in my house, uh, spilling water everywhere. Now I have some fans and dehumidifiers going. So I hope that others uh, sitting in warmer climates can uh, empathize with me a little bit. Um, so we're really happy to have you here for this uh, webinar, and it's nice to see in the attendees list some uh, some familiar uh, familiar names, but also I think really good to see some new names as well, some some people who perhaps haven't been as engaged in this process but are are eager to do so. Um, as uh, as uh, Hasikio and Jillian have said, we felt it very important to have a, a dedicated session and discussion on on marine and coastal biodiversity aspects of the uh, post 2020 monitoring framework. Um, we know how important indicators are and how important monitoring our efforts are, and this is especially tricky and complex in the ocean. Obviously, it's a complex three dimensional uh, systems. Uh, they're, they're dynamic systems and 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 often move across borders. In addition, we have conflicting uses and priorities in the oceans, as well as data gaps and difficulty in accessing uh, accessing certain areas and acquiring information on the different things that we really need to be measuring. So indicators are really essential uh, for, for the post-2020 framework to tell us, uh, are, are we doing the things that we need to do? Are they having the desired impacts? And, and are these impacts enough to get us to the goals that we've set? Um, the post-2020 framework, the goals and targets of the framework, speak to a range of priorities, um, not only conservation, of course, and will require an all-of-society approach. 
this means that we're going to have to measure and monitor many different types of things, things that perhaps we haven't uh, measured or at least uh, or at least measured in the context of biodiversity in, in the past. Um, the good news is that there are many different ongoing processes, including at the global level, but also at the regional uh, national levels, already ongoing to help us uh, address these and that, that provide useful information. And in fact, many of these often being uh, governmental uh, uh, reporting processes that are already ongoing that we can also use to, to uh, speak to the headline and to the uh, indicators for the post-2020 framework. Now the headline indicators and the other indicators, many of those are still uh, somewhat uh, higher level and, and, and generic and need to be translated into the ocean. We need to see what these look like in the ocean and what kind of information we need to speak to these. And we need expert advice on how to do this. So here in this webinar, as, as Jillian said, we're, we're going to um, present this, this information document that, that our, our great colleague Nick Fax has led the drafting of that will give some advice on, on, these, uh, on, on these issues. But we also have a panel of different uh, speakers from different processes that can uh, be in a position either presently or in the future to provide valuable information to speak to these indicators. Now, um, I want to also caveat that this, the panel that we have and the speakers that we have are just a snapshot of the many, many different processes that are out there um, that, that we know of that can help to uh, speak to these indicators. So we're just giving a sort of a, a, a snapshot of what's out there and, and types of things um, that we may consider using not only to craft the indicators and to craft what the framework looks like, what the monitoring framework looks like, but also in the future, how we can uh, speak to these uh, indicators. So we look forward to a productive discussion. And before passing back to the chair, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the platform that we have here and that we're, that we're using today, which is GoToWebinar. Um, some of you have probably or hopefully seen this before. Um, unfortunately, if, if you're if you're in the audience, you you don't have the capability to unmute and turn your camera on. This is to make things go a bit more smoothly. I'm sure we've been in, we've all been in many meetings that have been interrupted by uh, uh, someone accidentally turning a microphone on. But we still do want to have your interaction, and we will have dedicated question and answer sessions. To do that um, and to take part in that, you can submit questions directly into the question box. Uh, when it is time for question and answers, uh, uh, the uh, we or, or the chair will read out these questions and pose these to the panelists and speakers, uh, and hopefully address uh, address your uh, your questions and your and your points. Um, so, yep, that's it for me. Thank you. Back to you, chair. Thank you very much to both Julian and Joseph. And now, given that we have very limited time, we would like to make the best use of it. I will start uh, now turning to Mr. Nick Bax from CSIRO Australia and the Global Ocean Observation System, who will give an, an overarching team presentation. Nick's presentation is based on a very useful document provided as information for deliberations on the monitoring framework for the post-2020 biodiversity framework and available monitoring frameworks and information to support monitoring progress. So Nick, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and welcome colleagues. Um, and thanks, Joe and Gillian, for the for the general introduction. Um, as we discussed, um, mostly going to be discussing some of the summary items from this document highlighted in yellow on the uh, left part of the screen there. Um, just have to work out how to uh, make my computer go forward. Well, there we go. Um, I wanted to preface this with a little with something I was a little surprised at, um, which is that there are many multilateral, uh, many multilateral environmental agreements, over 500 in fact, dealing with transboundary biodiversity environmental issues. And uh, and many of these, there are about at least 23 uh, which relate to the marine area. Uh, many deal with sustainable imagined living marine resources, prevention of environmental pollution and other things like that. And, um, and there have been reviews for the World Ocean Assessment 1 and 2 through the United Nations regular process. There's been the IPBES recent reviews. There's been the high level panel and, uh, and so there's a lot of information out there. And uh, I think something we need to think about as we go through this process is, is kind of what makes the CBD process different from these. 
and how can we make it of, of most value and not just another review of the uh, of the biodiversity the status or decline of biodiversity um, so just a very brief slide on on the cbd um, vision which i'm sure you would know um, emphasizing that it's not just about conserving biodiversity it's also about a sustainable use and equity um, under the 2030 mission there is the global monitoring framework with four status goals 21 action targets and the subject of today is the headline component and complementary indicators and importantly uh, these have been designed um, so that they link with some of the UN sustainable development goal indicators so that they link to the UN system of economic and environmental accounting the ecosystem assessment which was approved last year and uh, and other other areas so that we're looking for commonality between these different reporting requirements the headline indicators in particular are a limited set of high level indicators report of each party and this is what really makes them very powerful in that they will be reported by each party um, rather than um, rather than by international groups of experts working independently so they have a lot of power because of that i think we need to make take advantage of that they can only track the overall progress against the goals and targets and they need to be based on established scientific or intergovernmental processes with an existing body to support and review the indicator um, component indicators and complementary indicators um, are also very important in providing the context of how the targets and uh, and goals are processing including how we attribute um, how these changes are occurring and also understanding how these different indicators and how the different targets and goals work together and are complementary. But to go back to the headline indicators, um, because I can't really present the information on all the, all the headline indicators and goals or the indicators for them, I thought what I would present is, uh, a, first of all, a summary of the status of the uh, of marine information available for the headline indicators arranged in this circle here from um, goal A round to target one through to target 21. And uh, of these I've kind of assessed that um, for two of them, just two of the uh, two of the goals and targets, the indicators which we currently have are adequate with ongoing development. And I'll go through these uh, in a moment. Um, seven have systems in place requiring global and thematic expansion. Um, a large number, 20, are reported as part of national statistics or expected to be reported as part of SDG statistics. Um, in some cases, there are marine alternatives available to, for an indicator, which sounds quite terrestrial. A couple of the indicators are not relevant to the marine uh, environment as currently um, presented. And there's several where more thoughts required that with some rewording, we could probably make them useful in the marine, marine instance. So to give some ex examples of what those indicators are like, adequate with ongoing development, it perhaps comes as a little surprising that these are some of the FAO indicators, um, which are, um, I think it's 567 fish stocks uh, surveyed every two years. So incredible le uh, amount of information, which I'm sure Kim will talk about later on. And uh, there's also um, information on the aquaculture and also the status of the world's aquatic genetic resources. So these are the kind of the indicators which uh, can be used straight away. Um, there are also systems in place which require global, global and thematic expansion. I think this is especially the case for goal, goal A, um, extent of selected natural and modified ecosystems. And there's a diversity of groups involved in looking at mangroves, FAO again, um, but also UNEP, WCMC, Global Mangrove Watch, Global Mangrove Alliance, salt marshes, coral reefs, which David the Bureau will talk about, um, and similarly for seagrass, macroalgae, intertidal habitats, wetlands. There are, there are groups observing these, and, uh, and we look at the different numbers of different, different areas we have you know something like a, a well over 100 countries reporting on the status of their coral reefs 
and close to 200 uh, reporting on, on mangroves. So there are already substantial sets of information that need to be brought together and uh, in some cases more globally. In our groups, global links, uh, the goose essential ocean variables, the global climate of variables, and the UN system of environmental economic accounting, um, which will help that process. Similarly, the ICN red list index is very well developed um, for some for some marine groups, cetaceans, sharks, and, and now coral. And um, I think we need to probably be able to work with the IUCN to get some of those other groups, marine groups, uh, suitable to be put on the red list index, which does require two sets of assessment before they can uh, before they can be used in that manner. Moving on to kind of areas which are reported as national part of national statistics, and this is which is the largest group, um, national environmental economic accounts, and uh, following the uh, acceptance of the ecosystem assessment by the United uh, St the UN Statistics Office. Um, that also meant that an ocean accounts framework is now being developed and the first meetings are occurring quite soon. So, so this will um, definitely promote the marine indicators in that process. Um, there are also other ones to be collected directly through the CBD uh, through national reporting and things like that. So there are groups which are currently reported as part of national statistics. Marine alternatives is available. I think this is one where we need to do a little bit of work, the Species Habitat in Index, which works very well on terrestrial um, areas from, uh, from primarily um, um, satellite data. Um, but for the, and it doesn't work so well in the deep sea. But we do have um, IPCC reports, which are very, um, very detailed in change, showing the change in distribution of habitats. We can look at marine metabolic habitat maps to understand where the ocean will support biodiversity based on its biological oxygen demand. And we can look at things like marine heat wave tracker, which are already available, can be downloaded by country to understand where marine heat waves are occurring and affecting the habitat. Um, some indicators are not relevant as proposed. Um, proportion of populations with species with a genetically effective population size of more than 500 doesn't apply to uh, to large marine populations of about a million animals but there are other techniques which which could get something perhaps similar um, if we were but it would require a lot of a lot of effort to get those kind of data um purport progress towards sustainable forest management um, is not something which set, looks immediately um, appropriate to marine, but it could be useful supplement to uh, indicate a to target five proportion of fish stocks within a biologically sustainable level, because this actually would get get that, the idea of um, what how many countries are able to have the processes of fish management which can drive them towards getting the fish with, fish stocks within a biologically sustainable level. And lastly, there's some um, I call more thought required. Um, some, uh, I think we, we haven't been looking at genetic resources uh, secured in facilities in, in the marine environment. Um, rate of alien, inv alien invasive alien species spread is problematic since the global invasive, invasive species program um, dropped funding in 2010. But we can look at things like um, how many parties are um, are signed up to the uh, International Convention for the Control of Management Ships, Ballast Water and Sediment, for example. Um, and there are other ones down here, I won't go through them all, um, but there are ones where more thought is required and we could use them. I'm particularly interested in the bottom one, land tenure in the traditional territories of indigenous peoples and local communities, where um, you know 47 million, I think it is, people in small scale fisheries are using these coastal resources and their access to those resources um, and the infrastructure to support them is critical. And so FAO again includes abolitory guidelines for securing sustainable, sustainable scale fisheries in the context of food security. So again, another source of information which could be used um, to refine or report on this uh, on this indicator.
Um, the prior priority gaps I, I thought of, of um, that really need to be um, filled um, to to support the indicator development is extending measurements of the extent of selected marine and coastal natural ecosystems um, for goal A, A 0 0.1, um, updating the red list assessments for marine and coastal species, especially for underrepresented invertebrate groups, um, develop a species habitat index for marine and coastal areas, um, improve monitoring of the effectiveness of marine protected areas, um, improve information on the management and control of marine invasive species, uh, improve in situ measurement of marine and coastal pollution. This is very poor. Um, very few nations are reporting on the uh, on the, on the Stockholm Convention, for example, and uh, include marine and coastal values in the UN SEA monitoring, which will go ahead with UN Oceans Ocean Accounts, and then continue development agreed agreed systems to monitor reduction in harmful fish subsidies. So those are some of the priorities I thought of, and no doubt there are there are others which will come up through discussions. Um, to conclude, um, there are existing marine and coastal monitoring frameworks available for many headline indicators, but often they'll need increased geographic or thematic coverage. Um, some marine input will require to the headline indicators will require work in the scientific community to adapt their reporting process, and some flexibility in matching available information to the indicator. Um, component and complementary indicators will be important to understand and attribute changes in headline indicators and the interaction. And unfortunately, at the moment, there is a disconnect between much of marine research and monitoring progress of the multilateral environmental uh, agreements. So we do require increased coordination with FAO, UNEP Regional Seas, ISCN, IOC, GeoBond, especially the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network and the broader scientific community. So. Hopefully today is uh, one way where we might we might start that um, increased coordination. But I think overall that, that the CBD process provides a good opportunity to raise the profile of marine issues and also to energize the monitoring and reporting capacity, which is currently used um, for, often for scientific purposes, but doesn't get into these kind of forums. And my final slide, the uh, um, the CBD post 2020 um, indicators, an important in opportunity to increase scientific engagement with decision makers and influence the SDG indicators for 2030 and the recently approved ecosystem accounts. Um, regional assessments may be more useful for some of the migratory species which cross borders. And also very importantly, respectively engaging with the IPLC will increase coverage of many of the more remote areas extend our understanding of their diverse values and reduce uh, help reduce the inequity in scientific capacity which is only increasing as we move forward and finally i'll just give a plug for the un decade for ocean science for sustainable development especially through marine life 2030 which really does or is trying to provide the structure to um, streamline the process of science science information re reaching the policy environment and uh, i will hand it back to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Nick, for this interesting presentation. I was taking some notes in how the different sources of information can help us for establishing the framework for monitoring through the headline indicators, the components, the complementary ones, and the analysis you present from 40 different indicators where nine let's say we can see on green state 23 between yellow and orange and eight in red so it implies a lot of work and we will see in the following presentations different options from different institutions that can help us to to build our uh, monitoring framework in particular for marine and coastal biodiversity we have a few minutes for some questions, so I invite you to use the box on questions for uh, Nick in the presentation. So I'll give you seconds while I'm reading because what I can see so far, and I ask my colleagues from the Secretariat, but I see there is a particular question to the CBD Secretariat, not the presenter, and um, how do CBD Secretariat and substitute chairs propose the work needed on marine indicators is taking forward. 
will a separate team work group for the proposed ATEG will be suitable forum to drive this work forward. And this is from Farah Chaudhry. And also know that there is work ongoing to address the 301 and the UK is funding two projects at present. I'm sure other parties are also investigating this and other targets. So we'll it will be worth doing some kind of stock take on ongoing development that may not have been captured in previous UNEP's WCNC paper. Uh, these are the two questions. So I'm wondering if Nick want to address the second one. I'm not sure. You have the floor. Otherwise, I'll give the floor to Secretariat. Um, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat that second question? Sure. How, do, uh, sorry, um, uh, there is work ongoing to address T301. The UK is funding two projects at present, and I'm sure that other parties are also investigating these and other targets. Uh, so would you, would it be worth doing some kind of stock take of ongoing development that may not have been captured in previous uh, uh, UNEP uh, WCMC paper. I think she is referring to, to the INF document that you present. All right. Yeah, sure. So um, I think it, 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 there, is, there are going to be new developments. And I think that's one of the exciting things about this is that, you know, the scientific community is realizing that there's a new and important forum for their information. And uh, so they're very keen to get that information into this process. I get many questions. How can they get their information into this process? Um, and of course, at the same point, the process has to be a very orderly process, as it's, uh, um, as you well know. Um, so no, I, I think there is a lot of more information out there. Um, at one point earlier in the discussion, um, in this process, there was a thought there would be a need for an ongoing panel which would be able to look at new information as it became available and understand its relevance to particular indicators. Um, so I, I imagine that will be important going through because over the next 10 years, we're gonna see a massive increase in the amount of information available. Right, thank you, Nick. As, as you know, part of the processing in Substa uh, includes the proposal for establishing an uh, an expert uh, uh, group on indicators that will continue its work after COP, uh, helping uh, 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 on the development of the monitoring framework. But I give the floor to Gillian. I, I think that, I mean, I was going to say the same thing. We have a, we are continuing to work on the monitoring framework from the secretary side in collaboration with Ezekiel and um, the, the SAPS to Bureau. To, to make sure that we have the right information available for SAPSTA. So there will be uh, metadata that's being released on the indicators, and we'll talk about this next week. Um, and there is a plan to provide some additional information which could inform the discussions at SAPSTA. The, the meeting, SAPSTA 24, I think really is the next real opportunity for this discussion to continue on the monitoring framework. And so, the the hope would be that the information from presentation and the paper that was being discussed today is something that parties would seriously consider and, and bring ideas forward to SAPSTA on, on how to include this information in the monitoring framework in a way that is going to be the most useful moving forward. In terms of rolling out the indicators and making sure that the monitoring framework is practical, uh, yes, the, the expert group that's being discussed, I think, is the way for that. And the way that this expert group is envisioned is that it would include uh, experts from a, a wide range of expertise. So you would have some people who maybe are, have more marine expertise in the group itself. But then this group would really serve as a coordination body. So if you look at the terms of reference, so many of the indicators require different expertise. You know, the, the expertise on measuring ABS is quite different from the expertise on measuring marine 
which is different from the expertise on, on measuring other things. And so there will be a need to work with different groups. And so this expert group would really need to coordinate with, with the marine experts, I think, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, there are questions about the um, availability of the recording of this session. I think the answer is yes. Um, there's a comment from A.G. Tanaka on the monitoring of coral reefs supports using data for C, no, GCRMN under ICRI. Thanks. Also from Gabon. Um, wants to know the link between target three on 30 by 30 and coastal marine biodiversity. Also, Marina from Finland mentions the regional work on marine and coastal biodiversity and assessment are critical, for instance, in the Arctic, Baltic Sea, Black Sea. The information need to be part of this family of indicators, including complementary, should not only postpone issues. And um, Sebastian Acosta, wondering if the remaining work in indicators could be related with the absence of an objective or target scoping on marine and coastal matters directly. That's a, that's a question. I'm wondering if, uh, again, Nick or Secretary would like to answer to these questions. Yeah, uh, thanks. I think, I think it is an interesting question um, because in some cases there will be an absence of information or an absence of agreements. I, I guess I would also add to that that um, the other thing I found quite interesting is where we do have international agreements on ballast water and sediments or ocean pollution, for example, and we have not all countries are signatories to those. and um, I think that in itself is a good measure of how we're responding to some of the uh, um, impacts on the marine environment. So I think those would be good indicators how many countries are signing up to those conventions or active members of them. And, um, and then yeah, there will be some for which uh, more work needs to be done. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, there are many sources of information. There is a lot of key indicators, but we're also struggling to have a, a kind of core set of indicators, the ones who qualify for headline, and then to, to identify the, the different components and also the complementary ones to, 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 to get, to really see how are we doing if we are addressing our goals and targets properly. Uh, uh, and this is a challenge. So we need, this is a lot of work that we need to do together to define this framework. I'm wondering if Secretariat has something to say with the other questions that I, I mentioned, the importance of, of regional opportunities or more questions in the box. I, th I think I'll let Joe answer that question. I will mention, which you mentioned, Ezekiel, sorry people in my background, that um, the recording will be online on the YouTube channel and it will also be uh, available on the website for this webinar series. And so you can easily find it there if, um, if you are looking for it. Thanks. And just to speak to the uh, the the, uh, the points that Marina raised about regional uh, regional assessments, and in, indeed regional uh, regional assessments and and, uh, and and the like are very important. We actually will have uh, as part of one of our as part of the panel uh, today um, a speaker from the Regional Seas Program of UNEP to talk about a lot of the work that's ongoing there that can be very useful to uh, to speak to the indicators. I'd also wish to note that. Um, in our ongoing work of the uh, Sustainable Ocean Initiative Global Dialogue with regional seas organizations and regional fishery bodies, we have focused on uh, on identifying ways and opportunities for um, for regional seas and regional fishery bodies to perhaps work together uh, and collaborate or at least work complementary in a complementary way to also not only implement the post-2020 framework, but help uh, the assessment and reporting processes related for the uh, for the uh, monitoring framework. So indeed, um, from the marine side, we're of course also keeping the regional picture in mind as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joseph. And last question is uh, how will be the sectoral indicators, for example, main group indicators being proposed by IUCN be integrated in the global post 2020 global biodiversity framework and, uh, and some of these uh, ecosystems like mangrove are key for the health of, of, of seas but it's an open question but well in principle i believe we will do this together to find the right ones to qualify for either headline indicators or or, or components or or complementary ones, uh, but to give the right weight and the importance. But I let my the, my colleagues, the, the Nick or Secretariat, to to comment on this and some put some ideas, and then to close this first part of our webinar. If you want to say something. Um, I mean, just just briefly. I mean, for. Me for many of these areas, and perhaps David will, David Abura will let us know that coral is not one of them. Um, there are different groups out there monitoring these area, these groups in different ways, and coming up with different statistics. And um, you know, I think you know that if the CBD can send a strong message to the scientific community that they need this information and they're going to make use of it, then hopefully that will galvanise the but scientific community to work together better than they are at the moment. So they will come up with one set of agreed indicators. And you know that would make all of our lives a lot easier. Uh, I think the scientific community needs to work together um, to come up with agreed sets of indicators, just as hopefully the multi multilateral environmental um, agreements will as well. Thank you, Nick. Yes. At least in the case of my country in Mexico, we have for many years already a very nice monitoring system in, 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 in uh, for mine groups using remote information and um, verification on the field that we can share with our colleagues on, on this, uh, as I said, on this very important uh, ecosystem for the health of seas that will be very useful. We can have a global platform on, on, on this point. If there are no more participations on this, I, I thank you very much, Nick, and 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 the questions received from from the various participants. And now let's um, move to the next session of our webinar of today. To turn to our panel, composed by five speakers from various international organizations and initiatives that can provide information to inform the reporting on the indicators for the post-2020 framework with respect to marine and coastal biodiversity. I wish to note that this panel does not include all of the various global and regional sources of information and reporting processes, but rather provide us with a useful snapshot of some of these. So, uh, I will mention them, the five of them, and I will be uh, inviting one by one to give the presentation. We have Nancy Soy from Junior Regional Seas Program, Kim Friedman from FAO, Claudette Spicheri from UNESCO, IOC, Ruth Fletcher from WCMC, and David Obuda from GeoBOM. So let's uh, start with the presentation of Nancy Soy of Junior Regional Seas Program. Nancy. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, can you, if I can get a confirmation that you can now see my screen? We can see the screen, but not the presentation mode. So we can see the small lights on the side. Maybe you need to switch screens if you are using more than one monitor, probably, or to maximize. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much uh, for giving me the floor. I'll be talking about. Uh, the regional seas program, what we are doing under the um, the indicators work. Um, 
This is just but an introduction to the work that you are currently doing. I may not go into the details of the work. I'll give you reference to some of the material that you can read to give you more information about the program, its, um, its work, and all that. But just to introduce the Regional SIS program, this was a program established by UNEP in 1974. To date, it has 18 conventions and action plans covering 100 and, over 143 countries, actually. Seven are administered by, U, uh, by UNEP, uh, and that is one in the Caribbean. We have uh, East Asia Seas, Eastern Africa, Mediterranean, Northwest Pacific, West Africa, and the Caspian Sea. And then we have seven that are non-UNEP administered, including the Black Sea, Northeast Pacific, Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, Rokmi, Southeast Asia, Southeast Pacific, and the Pacific. And then we have four that are independent programs, but they are part of the uh, regional seas program, and that is the Arctic, Antarctic, Baltic Sea, and Northeast Atlantic. So that is the a brief map of where all those uh, regions are uh, located. And uh, in terms of why the program was established was uh, to address the accelerating environmental degradation of the world's shared marine and coastal areas, including management of natural resources through a shared, um, a shared approach. So meaning in this case, uh, those countries that are sharing a region or a sea, they come together and establish uh, what you call an action plan. And then some uh, move from an action plan to a convention, which is a legally binding instrument for the management of their shared resource. Uh, and the aim was to strengthen the capacity within these regions to enable countries to implement the action plans and work programs through education, training, communication, and institutional building. And of course, the regional seas are not working alone. They are partnering with other institutions to deliver key functions, including information management, pollution monitoring, biodiversity conservation, among others. Um, and uh, as mentioned by Joy in his introduction, we also have seen a lot of collaboration between the regional seas program and the fisheries management bodies, including the regional economic commissions uh, and other uh, UN organizations and intergovernmental organizations as well. So in terms of mandate on biodiversity, uh, I would say that overall the regional seas programs, they have a mandate to conserve biodiversity. And in this mandate is covered in uh, different, or it's captured in different, um, you know, documentation that uh, is available within the, these uh, conventions. So you find it in the convention text. Uh, some are in specific protocols, strategies, COP decisions, or action plans. And I've listed the examples of some of the protocols that have been developed uh, by the regional seas, of course, in close collaboration with the CBD. So we have one in the Mediterranean. We have another one in Eastern Africa region, and the list goes on. But as I said, that is just one uh, example of some of the work that the regional seas are doing and, and uh, where they draw the mandate on, on um, biodiversity conservation. And uh, in terms of indicators, so back in 2015, the regional seas program, they came together during one of their annual meetings where, um, and this was in the run up to the adoption of the SDG goals in 2015, where they identified some of the priorities or some of the indicators that they can be able to contribute into supporting the implementation of the SDGs, particularly SDG 14. And as such, they identified um, common indicators or indicators that each and every uh, convention was at the moment or at that time, they were monitoring or they had developed uh, with the view that they would be able to uh, begin monitoring it at uh, sometime in the future. And as such, at that time, they came up with um, a list of 22 indicators. And what we've done here is try to categorize those indicators into uh, different categories or what they address and the list. So you'll see there that we have uh, several indicators that uh, touches on pollution. So they have um, uh, one on chlorophyll A concentration. There is 
uh, on trends of for, select, for selected priority chemicals, including POPs, quantification and classification of bit litter. And then uh, there's a, um, an indicator there also on that deals with climate change, and that is uh, one on sea surface temperature. There are some on fisheries and aquaculture, on fish catches within the EZ, application of risk assessments, uh, destruction of habitats due to aquaculture. There's also, uh, again, on uh, pollution and climate, fisheries, species habitats, uh, where we are talking about the distribution of the red, red list index species, there's trends in critical habitat extent and condition. Uh, and the list goes on up to the 20, up to 22. Again, we have um, additional indicators there on pollution, uh, where we are talking about the national action plans that um, look at reduction in the land-based sources of, of and so, land-based sources. We have um, also a percentage of coastal urban population connected to sewage uh, facilities, available port waste reception facilities, and many others. And then um, there's also one on climate change or national adaptation plans, and the ICZM, and again, another set of um, fisheries and aquaculture related indicators. So just to give you an indication of who, who is um, already monitoring some of those indicators, and I would want to uh, um, mention here that the indicators or the common indicators in this case may not be monitored by all the regional seas programs, uh, but you'll find that there are certain that are almost common or similar to what they're already tracking. So like, for instance, when you look at chlorophyll A concentration, uh, you'd find that Black Sea Commission, Helcom, OSPA, Mediterranean, Nairobi Convention, these are the, in, uh, the, some of the regional seas programs that are um, monitoring uh, indicators or, or collecting data that is um, more or less similar to that particular indicator. And then the, the, there are some, or at least all, almost all of them, collecting um, data and or, or other monitoring indicators on trends for selected variety chemicals. There is one on quantification and classification of beach litter items. You'll find that uh, Black Sea Commission, Elcom, OSPA, Mediterranean, Nairobi Convention, and PESGA already uh, are doing that. So I didn't give the full list, but just to give you an indication of who is doing what. Um, so again, clear. sorry. You have two minutes left, Nancy, please. Yes, okay. So uh, the, the list continues up to there. And um, just to mention here that uh, the application of the common indicator is still work in progress. Currently, we have some regions, for, uh, we have five regions that are yet to establish common indicators. We have five in the process of putting one in place. Four regions have a monitoring framework um, and using it to develop their state of cost reporting. And then four are, you know, they already have a predefined target using the common indicators. Um, they also have a database and information portals where they're collecting this data and they're shareable. I'll give you a link in the, in the next uh, page. And uh, I've given the links to uh, additional resources that you can read about the program, their capabilities and all that. So this is where we have the link of uh, where the databases that they are storing this data that they're collecting from their uh, participating countries are stored. And then uh, this is my last slide, just to mention that we also have an indicators working group. And this is um, a group that works as an advisory body to the regional seas um, indicators work. And the membership is, is open. We have currently we have only um, representatives of the, sec of the Secretariat of the regional seas program but you hope that in the near future we'll partner with organizations that are also doing similar work, including the IOC of UNESCO, the OCPD, and, and the list goes on. And then we already have uh, agreed terms of reference for the, the indicators working group. And currently the progress is that we are working on a regional seas indicators monitoring framework. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. I'm, I'm sorry for pressing that uh, we have very limited time for our webinar and still more presentation. So I invite participants to take note 
and to leave you questions at the end of this series that we can uh, give time to presenters to respond to your questions. Now let's move to the next one with Kim Friedman from FAO. Kim, you have the floor. You can see it, but we cannot hear you. Okay, I'm muted. That's a good start. Can you hear me now, Ezekiel? Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair, and good day and good evening, everyone. This talk presents a little bit about FAOCs and measures the aquatic world when considering approaches to improving people's relationship with nature in order to deliver food security, vibrant communities with sustainable livelihoods linked to resilient and productive ecosystems. It will center on how we can develop a common conversation on the status of our world, and especially focusing on fisheries, one that enables us to describe the world we live in, adapt our actions, and work towards a better, commonly envisioned future. Okay, let's start with marine systems. Marine systems are major players in global biodiversity, especially for animals. The ocean supports 34 phyla, over double the uh, groups compared to those found on land. And that's if we look at the left hand side, but uh, looking at the infographic on the right hand side, noting that each cube is a million metric tons of carbon, the ocean holds the greatest weight of vertebrate life, as well as most taxonomically diverse forms of life on the planet. And the top block there is arthropods, marine arthropods. Then we get down to fish and we keep going. Right at the bottom, you'll see humans and livestock. And, and even further down, you'll find wild animals. This just gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Now, stepping back and looking at the bigger global picture, the ocean will be an important provider of food to people in the coming decades. This graph below shows that there was a downward shift in the number of undernourished in the world until about 2014. However, this trend in those affected by hunger globally has been slowly on the rise since then. In reality, all food production systems have impacts on biodiversity. However, if fisheries fail, the environment impacts on our food needs transferred to the terrestrial environment would be huge. And if hunger, poverty, and conflict continues, we lose our opportunity for global progress to ensure resource and environmental sustainability. So let's think how we consider or think about and measure the uh, marine environment. The way we think and measure nature is always changing, but this is an important driver of our vision and therefore where we make our investment. First comes the obvious one is a species view. This needs to include wild and domesticated biodiversity. If both need management in a complementary way, they often occur, on, occur in the same places and yet have different management approaches and stakeholders. We are slowly moving our collective gaze from a species focus to examine more integrated spaces across all pillars of the triple bottom line and better considering their interconnectedness. Better related to function is an ecosystem view. The global ecosystem approach to fisheries and aquaculture is now coming into its early adulthood in human terms. We invested heavily in shifting our thinking and policy, but we're only now really working to get this right on the ground. With access to better technology, we're now getting a better appreciation of genetic diversity. We need to view populations and get indicators on their change through time. So genetic ecosystem and ecosystem levels with the genetic level of particular importance in domesticated biodiversity is is already giving us an inkling of how complex the picture we need to deliver so that we can start, discuss together progress in the marine environment. But conservation requires active management engagement, not just of wild and domesticated life, but of people with the rest of nature at all levels of social environmental systems. How do we make this visible through indicators? How do we get the top down and bottom up happening and this vision to work across the whole value chain. That's a discussion that's been going on for decades and will carry on in the next decade. 
I've tried to draw a little kind of funnel here to give you an idea of the way I'm seeing things happen, because not only do we need to look across life, across the different levels of the CBD's goals, but we also have to look how information filters from the ground all the way up to some type of headline indicator at the bottom of that funnel. And as Nick pointed out, there's just numerous amounts of information out there, all of different shapes and sizes, which do track uh, what people are interested in, but don't necessarily deliver a headline indicator straight off the bat. So what I've done here is I've broken it up into three levels. Uh, I believe that getting indicators on fishery sustainability and achieving fishery sustainability is going to be difficult. But how should we invest across sustainability programs, especially for the developing regions that need the best help, the most help? And Nick mentioned the many measures and many different processes for me measuring change, but we need our targets to allow 100% effectively managed seascapes. So how would we track the progression of information from on the water to a global vision of marine sustainability? Well, level one is just the water level. That's where everyone's working on different environments, different stocks, different populations. Whereas level two is kind of like an amalgamation of various signals by different organizations. So we're going from a fisheries minister up to a national stats office. And then lastly, level three, the way I see it, is related to headline indicators for reporting on things like the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and the SDGs. So let's just dive into, yep. let's dive into level one. This is the lion's share of the action where most of the task is needed. We need to leverage people's and sectoral ministries' progress on the ground and not dictate to it. Where there's much data, the answers are clearer. Where not, we need to invest and work harder. In this task, the post-2020 practitioners need to work hand in hand with national resource managers as they are working and interacting with biodiversity across the vast majority of spaces where biodiversity is riches. And that includes markets and, and um, the kind of interactions of users. When we get to level two, we need to build successful, we need to build on the successful initiatives that are already in place. Nick mentioned a few and existing indicators that amalgamate national, regional and global signal. There's a lot of consolidated policy work already in place. It doesn't need to be restarted. It just needs to be strengthened in, in practice. Think of the ecosystems approach to fisheries and aquaculture and multiple sustainable ma management practices. We need to leverage the full range of options open to feed into that post-2020 framework headline indicator. And in, at FAO, we're now at 25 years of the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, and they run a biannual questionnaire of 119 countries and 36 RFBs. Uh, and more countries are joining all the time. And the results contain detailed information on the implementation of the ecosystem approach to fisheries, which is highly relevant to the main components of IHE Target 6. And I'll just remind you what they were. Okay, we also need to have conservation measures from groups like IUCN that talk to species and clade level information at national, regional and global signal. But we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that all non-human life in the ocean is doomed by unsustainable use. This 2021 study showed that 72% of species were characterized as least concern on the IUCN red list, with nearly half having stable or improving population trends. And then we get to level three. This is where we are talking about the major groups speaking into COFI, the Committee on Fisheries, the SDGs, and, and leveraging the opportunities that come around ecosystem restoration decade and what Nick mentioned, the uh, decade of ocean science for sustainable development and even annual pushes such as the International Year for Sustainable, um, sorry, Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. What we need to do is make sure there's uptake and use of tools and solutions for setting indicator standards and measuring which indicators, is which is crucially important. Awareness raising needs to carry on this need will be ongoing through the decade. We need to assist those that want to implement positive change in taking theory and policy into their daily practice, which is all around level one, and in measuring the effectiveness of change using multiple indicators through time. We need to keep the conversation alive over the next 10 years and encourage harmonization around successful strategy where possible with thematic support from the CBD secretariat and others. 
So what support mechanisms are we going to be able to enable in the next 10 years of work ahead of us? And what I'm putting here is an empty house and I'm suggesting we need to fill this post 2020 house with all those who are reliant on biodiversity and support them on their journey. So we don't want to build an empty post 2020. Also not forgetting that we will need, that we will and will need to innovate with new technologies on the water and on land and adapt as such, and especially with things like uh, genetic technologies and so on. These are going forward with leaps and bounds. We don't know what's available. And lastly, I want to talk about money. Value is where you decide it is. These are crypto punks. They're about 10,000 unique collectible digital characters where proof of ownership is stored on the Ethereum blockchain. Last June, one sold for 11.7 million US dollars. This gives you an idea of my saying value is where you decide it is. Global private finance is of the magnitude of 400 trillion under management, while food systems are around 8 trillion. Do you know the world's net worth tripled in the last decades, rising from 156 trillion to over 500 trillion in 2020? Ultimately, we need rules of the game that align with a sustainable future. We need to align these financial flows with the work of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So what does investment in conservation Thank you, Kim. Mean? Kim, you're yeah. over time. Please, to be fair with the other uh, yeah. presentation. Okay. Uh, that was my last slide. I was just pointing out there, Ezekiel, that the scale, uh, I'll close down now. The scale is that, the, if you look on the right, that's the scale of investment that we've currently got in conservation. And I think we need to grow that pie as well as make sure our, our techniques are good. So I'll just close off. Thank you very much, Kim. I invite part, uh, participants to give your questions to the end of the series. Uh, and now I'll give the floor to Claudette Spiteri from UNESCO. Claudette, you have the floor. You have eight minutes as agreed previously. Yes, hello, everybody. Do you see my screen? We hear you and we can see your screen. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you um, yeah, some of the activities at uh, IOC UNESCO that could be uh, relevant for today's topic. Um, basically, my presentation is divided into two main parts. The first part, I will um, go briefly uh, over the activities under IOC UNESCO, and that's mainly including the OBIS. The, that stands for Ocean Biodiversity Information System, the GOOSE, uh, the Global Ocean Observing System, and specifically the Biological and Ecosystem EO, EOVs, and also the, the potential possible relevance of the Global Ocean Science Report and the data collected for that report. And in the second part, I will um, I will uh, introduce the ocean decade, so the UN decade for ocean science. I uh, refer also to the monitoring and evaluation framework for the ocean decade that is currently um, in progress and development. Um, and also examples of uh, endorsed decade programs that could potentially um, provide uh, knowledge, but also data for the CBD process. Um, do you see? No. Why I cannot go <laughs> one screen down, one slide down here? Maybe if you press enter, probably moves. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. Um, so to start off with the OBIS, um, here in this uh, global map, you see um, the, the number of records that are currently in OBIS. That's uh, around 80 million um, records of uh, ma marine species distributions. Um, and together, altogether, there you can find more than 160 million measurements. If you also include um, biological and environmental parameters, um, so OBIS is a global open access data and information clearinghouse system. Um, and uh, basically, the main point is that it uh, has a lot of potential to to measure, let's say, changes in biodiversity and also changes coupled to to environmental changes. Um, just 
just to, to add on, uh, data in OBIS comes from uh, around 1,000 institutions worldwide, but it's, the data handling is uh, it's the responsibility of uh, 32 so-called OBIS nodes that are um, regional, uh, national, or thematic nodes dealing with different data sets. Now, OBIS has already been used for several uh, global and regional uh, assessments, and you can see some examples uh, in, uh, in the slides. Uh, there, uh, for instance, uh, just to highlight one, it's the, the recent Global Harmful Algal Bloom uh, Status Report from, from last year, um, which also draws on the, on the data contained in, in OBUS, but that's not the, the only assessment. Um, also, OBUS is used to support the identification of ecologically and biologically significant areas. Um, as you can see there, um, basically the, the data is, uh, is uh, supporting the biodiversity indices that defines these, these areas. And, and also just to mention that the, the codes, the scripts uh, in R that are used to, to calculate these biodiversity indices and other matrix, they, uh, they, can be, uh, they are publicly available through the JIT, uh, GIT repository. Um, some more uh, application examples of OBIS, just as an illustration here, um, a specific example of a project in, in Fiji um, for which OBIS is used, um, let's say, as a basis for establishing a warning system for marine invasive species. Um, so let's say in a more generic terms, uh, it can be used to support countries in setting up uh, biodiversity monitoring systems. And another example, before I move on to the other uh, elements, it's that of uh, the eDNA monitoring uh, supported by OBIS that it's um, organized through citizen science uh, campaigns in, uh, in World Heritage, Heritage Sites of UNESCO. So this is just to show the different, let's say, applications of this uh, global open access system. So the second element that I mentioned at the beginning is that of uh, GOOSE, and in particular GOOSE uh, Biology and Ecosystem uh, Monitoring Facility that is uh, currently under development, but that uh, certainly would have uh, strong links with the CPD headline indicators. And here, um, yeah, the challenge or the opportunity is actually to, to have better coordination and in a way that this system will sy systematically deliver uh, on the B uh, CBD indicators. So I think with that, the timing is right in order to, uh, to align the, the, the developments. Um, and thirdly, under the IOC UNESCO umbrella, it's the, um, the Global Ocean Science Report. The latest one uh, was uh, published in 2020. Um, and for this report, a lot of uh, data and information is collected on uh, basically how and where and by whom uh, ocean science is, is conducted. Um, in there, there could also be uh, some elements that could help in, uh, in tracking and monitoring uh, the, CBT, uh, the CBT framework. Two minutes left. Thanks. Now, moving on to the ocean decade, here we see the architecture of the decade going from, uh, let's say, the decade actions that address objectives and also the, let's say, the, the challenges. What is important to highlight here is that challenge two uh, specifically addresses uh, biodiversity. It's uh, here you see it. It addresses the protection and restoration of ecosystems and, bi and biodiversity. Um, however, other challenges also uh, are interconnected. For example, challenges that deal with uh, ocean observing system, you see it here, or with, uh, with digital representation with data elements. Um, in the first round uh, of uh, decade actions, um, 20 programs, 35 projects, and seven contributions have been 
uh, and doors that specifically address challenge two, so biodiversity. And in the current uh, call for decade actions, there is um, challenge two is one of the of the of the main focus. So we are, we are also expecting uh, submissions of uh, of actions that uh, that specifically address biodiversity. Here, as I mentioned, currently we are developing the monitoring and evaluation framework for the decade. Um, without going into a lot of detail, there is certainly a lot of uh, synergies, potentially overlap in this pillar here, where we relate, re relate the ocean ticket to other uh, policy frameworks, as well as um, here in the outcomes, um, we, we will assign uh, seven headline indicators that from what I could see from the earlier presentations, we are basically talking about the same uh, existing indicator. So there is a, certainly scope for, for collaboration and stream, streamlining. Um, so my last element is uh, examples of endorsed decade, uh, decade programs from the first call of uh, actions that uh, I, I believe are highly re relevant in this context. Uh, Marine Life 2030 has already been mentioned, but it's not the only one. There are other ones, as you can see. I will not go into the detail. If you would like to know more, you can visit the website here with the catalog of all um, decade actions that have been endorsed. Um, this is my last slide, it's basically wrapping up and uh, highlighting some possibilities for collaboration, for instance, for using OBUS in, uh, for the Global Biodiversity Outlook for the CBD, and also using OBUS for supporting national reporting on the CBD with the idea or with the aim to reduce reporting burden. And there might be other opportunities, as I already mentioned, under the Global Ocean Science Report and the data that is collected for that. Um, synergies, overlaps uh, between the CPD indicator framework and the, the framework that is currently being developed for the ocean decade, as well as hopefully uh, knowledge generated from the decade programs that could feed into the CBD framework. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Clovet, for presentation. Now we move to the presentation of Ruth Fletcher from WCNC. Ruth, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen. Right, are you seeing the correct screen? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ruth Fletcher. I work for the United Nations Environment Programme World Conservation Monitoring Centre. So as we've seen, um, data is really essential to support indicators to understand our direction of travel, to really work out whether we're going in the direction we hope to be going, whether we can really manage to reverse the, the challenge of biodiversity loss that we're seeing. So UNEP WCMC, we really um, we work a lot with data collecting, supporting um, data collation, um, synthesis, um, generating indicators and methodologies, and looking at innovative technology and trying to also provide capacity development to support um, the, the produce the production of data. One of the key um, data sets that we um, support is the collation of the World Database on Protected Areas. Um, so this is uh, up to date and authoritative data um, submitted by governments um, and updated monthly to provide the most um, up to date information possible. And what we're trying to do is track achievements to all global targets, so um, collating this information together into a single place. This, um, the database is supported by a number of different aspects. So you've got the World Database on Protected Areas the World Database on other effective area-based conservation measures, and also the Global Database on Protected Area Management Effectiveness. Um, and interesting from a marine perspective, um, data on OECMs has shown the greatest growth in marine and coastal OECMs recently. So that is obviously a really active area that we're seeing. So data is more than just coverage, and, and this is looking 
um, back and learning from the past in terms in, in order to to support us in the future global biodiversity framework but looking at global um, actually target 11 it's more than just coverage so what we're trying to do is ensure that depth is available in terms of the indicator tracking so understanding equitable and effective management for example the global database on protected area management effectiveness has um, data from a large number of countries over 160 countries have done some effectiveness assessments um, at their, on their protected areas Although this only um, accounts for about 18% of the coverage um, in terms of the protected areas that are covered. So there's more work needed there and we're supporting workshops at the moment um, to try and improve this. There's also connectivity and ecological processes and, and climate adaptation is obviously highly supported by understanding connectivity. Ecological representativity is another aspect that's important. So it's not just obviously the, the generation of protected areas, but where they are and whether they're covering a variety of different habitats and areas. And then whether or not we're looking at um, protecting specific areas of importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services. So these analyses and the, the variety of data sets that we pull together is um, along with partners around the world. So this is certainly not just um, work that we do, but work we do in collaboration. And um, the last report on the um, Archie Target 11 um, is available at that link at the bottom there. The other area of work that we, we are also um, focused on is um, habitat um, collation of data. And as we know, these, are, these areas, um, coral reefs, mangroves and so on, are really important for the provision of um, ecosystem services, coastal protection, biodiversity support, livelihoods, fisheries. And so what we're doing is trying to support this um, collation of this information as far as possible through um, Ocean Plus Habitats, which is bringing together the current available global data on this. So this um, includes warm water corals, salt marsh, mangroves, seagrass, cold water corals. And we know that there is um, significant challenges for these habitats. And what we're trying to do is get um, time series data to show that change over time. And that's not available for all of these um, habitats. I know that mangroves is one of the ones that's most advanced in terms of providing a time series of data. And coral, I think we'll hear from David much more about that. Things like cold water corals, it's really challenging. They're very far from shore, they're deep um, under the water. So getting this information is difficult and it's, it's all about bringing together um, the capacity and the various people that we have, the scientists around the world, the networks around the world to really help generate this information. Um, through this website, what we're trying to do is, is show what is available at the global scale and also provide that national level lens. National data will always be likely better than global data, but what we're doing here is to show what is available at the global scale, but with that national lens, showing which um, habitats are from these global data sets are within protected areas, for example, and linking to the red list of threatened species from IUCN, seeing which of these um, habitat forming species are currently threatened or endangered. As we've heard from other um, panelists today, these, these aspects are really important to share to really work together and truly try and bring together all the different people that are involved in the processes and use the data across the board. Information about habitats is important for such a variety of processes. Um, and I think I'm going quite fast here because this is my last slide, so hopefully we'll catch up a bit of time. But um, there's a variety of pieces of the puzzle with each different um, community has something to, to bring to the table. And what we're trying to do is bring those pieces together to provide that global picture. But at the national, local and regional scale, as we've heard from Nancy, there's a lot of work um, going on to, to engage and support um, an upscale data. And we hope this will continue into the future to really generate that um, the support we know is needed for the, the post-2020 global framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, and to 
to be very quick in your presentation. Let's move to our last presentation. Unfortunately, we're running out of time allocated for our webinar. So I'll give the floor to David Obura from Geobon. David, go ahead. I think you are mute. We cannot hear you. Thank you, Ezekiel. And I hope you can you see. Maximize your screen, please. Okay. We can see. Or to switch. Yeah, is that the right? No. Nope. To switch. Okay. Work it out. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be presenting for you on behalf of Geobon, the Group on Earth Observations by the book. Biodiversity Observation Network, and more specifically, uh, on behalf of the Marine uh, Biodiversity Observation Network under Geobon. I'll also present a little bit of an example on coral reefs, which is what I work with, um, and from my organization uh, in Cordia, East Africa, based in Kenya. Now, um, Geobon and MBON's mission is to improve the acquisition, coordination, and delivery of biodiversity observations and related services to users, including decision makers and the scientific community. Um, now, the, the marine side of Geobon has been very active uh, for a number of years. It works through um, some networked uh, projects of collaborators. Um, and there are many similar types of organizations and similar networks, which may not be part of the MBON system yet, but, but can uh, progress into that, uh, the GCRN or the Coral Reef Network being one of them. Uh, and I'll go through that as an example of how we can bring marine information uh, into these more network processes and from those into the, uh, the global biodiversity framework and the monitoring process. Now, Geobon has focused efforts through the development of essential biodiversity variables. Uh, now, these are intermediate variables in that middle segment there. David, David, uh, David sorry to jump in. I think it, it'd be, uh, we're not actually following your slides. We see it's still in the, uh, in the working mode. So if you put it in presenter mode, we could go along because we're still seeing your first slide. I see. Okay, let me end show and try and get back to it. Um, See, I might not have selected the right. Okay, I'll select my main screen then and hopefully this will work. Can you see it again now? Yes, you just have to put it in presenter mode at the bottom. All right, thanks, thanks Joe, for that. Perfect, yeah, thank you. So, you have a slide on essential biodiversity variables up now. Um, and so, the scientists are monitoring. Um, Programs collect these primary observations on the left through in situ observations or remote sensing. It's really through these intermediate variables, uh, which are uh, obtained through data integration, often using biodiversity models, that this data can be really used um, and reported through various spatial units, such as countries, in particular in this case, for biodiversity change indicators and for, for different use purposes. Uh, the essential biodiversity variable framework is coherent uh, with um, the essential ocean variable framework, which has been presented, um, which was developed through GOOSE and IOC processes. And it's really um, slightly different perspectives on how to do this, um, but the essential the EBV framework identifies those six key classes of information, and these can move through to the headline indicators and support them, as mentioned by Nick at the, at the, at the beginning. And the essential variable framework has really matured a lot in the last three years through these observing frameworks for climate, for weather, and then oceans as well. And so in focusing on ocean variables, what um, the Goose uh, Biology and Ecosystems Panel has done is uh, to identify these key variables on the, on the right that are, can be monitored or have been monitored consistently globally. Uh, or have the potential for that and developing those so that they can serve the purpose of these uh, biodiversity variables for the ocean. Now, I'd like to make a comment on this issue of headline components and complementary indicators, because this is important, and this is the subject of an information document that has just been released last night, in fact, for Substern and the, and the post-2020 process coming up in Geneva. 
And this is to be clear about um, the connectedness between um, the targets, the milestones and goals in the framework, and that we need to measure the outcomes for biodiversity on the right in the milestones and goals. And seven areas have been identified uh, listed uh, below and that these are addressed by a range of headline indicators or proposed headline indicators that, that have been identified. Now there's a wide range of other indicators needed for the, the action targets, which really address indirect and direct drivers of biodiversity loss on the left. These are sort of the components and complementary indicators. We're well aware of the area under protection and management effectiveness indicators. Um, from previous work under the IG targets and previous presentations have identified some of these that I've listed here under specific targets. But the key thing is that in order to understand biodiversity change and improvements on the right and the outcomes, we also need to identify the right um, driver indicators on the left, which need to be changed first in order for the biodiversity uh, indicators to also change direction. Uh, towards positive modes. So it's very important to also focus on good and solid components and complementary indicators that can really give a forewarning of whether the, the framework is being implemented well and can expect improved biodiversity outcomes on the right. And this is very important in the ocean as well. I'll jump to the coral reef example. So the, coral reef, the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network has been functioning uh, as the coral reef Biodiversity Observing Network for the last 25 years, really. We produced a global update report in October 2021. And this is the graph of hard coral cover, which is really a, um, an indicator that can serve the ecosystem area and integrity uh, headline indicators needs for A01 and A31 uh, are their codes. Um, and we've picked up change at global levels related to these global coral bleaching events, the three global ones indicated there. We also were able to assess a second essential biodiversity or ocean variable on a rele relevant ecosystem integrity, so algae cover or the, the ratio between coral and algae on a coral reef. Now, the report we did gives a, for, um, a foresight of some of the regional networks and regional reporting that can happen. Um, and in order to support national and management indicators at finer resolution, and for example, uh, in the red listing process for coral species and red listed ecosystems for corals that are currently underway, we're using the GCRM and data to inform that. And this is also supported by a data model uh, to uh, enable the aggregation of data, but also to guide capacity building in coming years. Other indicators are also needed that relate to other parts of the monitoring framework. Um, so. Uh, and the International Coral Reef Initiative, which is the parent body for the GCRMN, has provided uh, recommendations to the GBF um, for coral reef indicators. So these two indicators that we have reported globally, but then additional indicators in green that are already available from different sources and in orange that uh, need further development. Critical things are that some of these indicators uh, you may only be able to use them at smaller scales in the global, um, you can link to other existing processes for obtaining them. And this critical issue of also needing to develop these driver indicators um, so that we can monitor the effectiveness of actions to produce biodiversity outcomes. Just to finish off now and here, in fact, I'm reiterating some of the previous uh, presentations, which is good, uh, showing the coherence that is emerging. That really the, the Goose, Embon, and OBIS already work closely together to make uh, turn observations into data products and indicators that can be used. The Marine Life 2030 uh, program uh, under the Ocean Decade is a particular platform that can support this process and I think can really support this marine and coastal work for the, for the convention moving forward with implementing the monitoring framework of the global biodiversity framework. So my final slide is these concluding remarks and is really to ask what existing or emerging indicators do we collect that can be packaged under headline components and complementary indicators? Are there improvements in the wording of these headline components and complementary indicators to make them more applicable and to help the supply of data to them? Are there key elements of biodiversity that are missing uh, that need to be included? What existing national, international, and convention monitoring and reporting processes can supply the required data, so minimal additional investment is needed. The role of these entities in moving forward and supporting this process, and then coming back to the primary role of national delegations and frameworks, because uh, these really underpin 
the finalization of the monitoring framework itself, but also the responsibilities and validation for reporting under the convention. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, unfortunately, I see that we are over time of the space allocated for this webinar. The program was very packed. I'm asking my colleagues from Secretariat if we can extend a few minutes more. But meanwhile, I do thank to all presenters. We have a panoramic view of different sources of information from the regional CIS program with Nancy and the contribution of these regional efforts and the presentation of FAO, looking at the biodiversity levels, but also the social dimension and the funding and the changing conduct and the involvement uh, with people that is highly needed in the case of marine and coastal and marine biodiversity, the work of UNESCO with obvious and the global and regional assessments, access, connection with heritage sites, information derived of this uh, information and the oceans decade, including SDGs, policy framework, um, challenges, outcomes, and um, uh, the presentation from Ruth Flesher from WCMC, a lot of information on protected areas, but also, also in other effective uh, areas for conservation, uh, information derived from biodiversity laws and different habitats like corals, mangroves, and salt marshes, uh, global data, and how to transit from global to national information, and also with David from Geobon on biodiversity variables, ocean variables, different levels on biodiversity, sources of information, and how can these connect with the global goals, headline indicators, and different examples like the Coral Reef Initiative, and uh, uh, as elements that we can take into account while thinking in our framework. I've been told that uh, we can extend a few minutes more, fortunately. So I invite you to write some questions and to end with a very quick round with presenters to respond to some of them. There, there were already some questions before on funding, but I believe this is part of implementation mechanisms that we can discuss in, in other places of our convention. And uh, also information on mind groups. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, at the screen. If there are questions for the five presentations we just had, uh, um, it's um, considering basal area, of course, are in low GDP countries. The funding, I believe, this is more a matter of uh, means of implementation. That's a whole part of this. How EFSA's incorporated this is one question from René Sauvé also from Arthur Dahl it says given the challenges to coordinate different initiatives all different initiatives is there any replacement for the UN system wide air watch coordination function implemented by UNEP from 92 to 2000 it includes MAS and the scientific community and led indicators development I don't see more questions in the box so far. Um, if you are interested, this is the time to use our last minutes. There's also another question from Hannah, what is better strand? Uh, most data is biological. Important to consider drivers of biodiversity loss, sustainable use by indigenous peoples and local communities, for instance, and to support tenure rights and the human rights will be important such. How can this be integrated in the framework? And we saw in FAO presentation the importance also to link with people and, and, and the importance, the involvement of, of indigenous people and local communities and all different stakeholders. Inclusion is an important element for our framework for the next decade. I still uh, uh, reading questions and then I'll invite for a quick round for those presenters who wants to respond to some of them so please listen to the questions. Um, James Cairo says uh, post 2020 target indicator seems even more complicated 
uh, by IH targets that we never fulfill. In panel's view, how can we incentive monitoring and reporting without losing quality data? And, and uh, Lileve, Lileve says, uh, well, thank you for the presentations. Those any uh, presenters would like to take the floor to respond to some of these questions. We have a few minutes. Is that the case, please? Yes, uh, uh, you can open your, your screen as Joseph from Secretary did. Joseph, you have the floor. Sure, thank you. I think maybe I'll I'll, uh, I'll kick off here with the uh, addressing the question about EBSIS. So I think I think also just to remind the panelists and the chair that uh, the the audience can't see the questions. Uh, they submit, but they can't actually see them until we answer. So if you're answering a question, uh, make sure you you remind everybody which question you're answering. Um, so our, our colleague uh, Renee Sauvé from Canada asked a very a very uh, important question that we've actually been posed quite a few times: is how are EBSIS incorporated ecologically or biologically significant? Marine areas. I think it may seem a bit odd to some that um, that we have a lot of work going on on the EBSIS. Uh, the CBD, is, as many of you know, the, C the CBD Secretariat coordinates a global process to facilitate the description and mapping of EBSIS around the world. Um, we have more than 320 EBSIS at the moment, but they don't appear as such in that we don't really see EBSIS as, as clearly in the targets and in the uh, indicators. Now, the reason for that is because, as, as many of you know, the designation or the identification or description of an EBSA does not entail a direct or specific action that needs to be taken. Many different countries use EBSAs for different purposes. Um, so basically, although EBSAs are not uh, doing, uh, having an EBSA doesn't mean you're, you're actually, you know, putting a, it doesn't mean exactly or, or specifically that you have a protected area in place or that you're going to do something in that area. It's it's a basis to make those decisions and it's a basis to, to actually do those things. So, uh, for example, we know our, our colleagues in South Africa have used their EPSA specifically to inform their marine protected area processes. We know other countries in, in West Africa have used their EPSA specifically for spatial planning processes. So for those targets, the EPSA has become a really important starting point and an important basis to identify and, and not only identify what you're doing in those areas, but also a focus for monitoring, for assessing the biodiversity in those areas. So although EBSAs are not perhaps explicitly there as, as clearly in the targets or indicators as some might expect, they are an important foundational uh, enabling factor to actually uh, do those things and measure the things that we want to measure. Um, so thank you. Happy to, happy to address that question. Thanks. Thank you, Joseph. I see five faces of presenters. I I'm guessing all of you want to say something. Now, my proposal is to give up to three minutes to each one to say whatever you want to respond to them, following in the reverse order of our presentations to, to make it fun. Uh, so I invite David to respond, followed by Ruth and Claudette. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I'll take the, the question that was asked on drivers um, and participation uh, with Indigenous peoples and local communities, because we think that is uh, a very important point. And yes, that was one of the points I was trying to make, that while the biodiversity indicators are, of course, very important to the outcomes and monitoring whether we're um, moving towards the milestones and goals, the targets are around implementation, so it's equally important uh, to monitor sustainable use issues, access, equity, and participation issues. And these are all covered under different targets uh, of the framework as is. So by implementing the framework uh, comprehensively um, and monitoring uh, those, those target implementations, we can then ensure that we're moving towards the outcomes for biodiversity, use, and access, and equity that, that are in the outcomes and goals. So yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David. Ruth, you have the floor. Also, you can see there's a new question as well. Um, thank you. I was going to answer the question around challenges of coordination. Um, partly, I mean, I'm not speaking for UNEP, but there is a lot of work in coordination going on across the, the uh, multilateral, multilateral environmental agreements and through processes such as the UN Decade on Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, there is a lot of work and one of the things that we do is look at synergies between these processes um, to try and improve that collation and collection of data. 
I think part of that is to do with the methodology for indicators. And um, one of the things that we work on is trying to make sure that the methodology is simple and clear so that um, it, the data can be collected at, at various scales and then aggregated and coordinated to, to the national and international level. So I think if all of us continue to work together on that basis, I think we'll be, you know, that coordination will continue to happen. I think processes such as this, and thank you to the CBD for supporting this uh, webinar, are, are quite a good way of, of helping continue that. Thank you. Also, those are important criteria in order to identify the right headline indicators. For example, that we can transit from different scales and there is a robust rationale behind. Now I'll give the floor to Claudette, followed by Kim. Um, yeah, so the point I also wanted to elaborate on was the this point of co coordination and collaboration. As I mentioned, we're in the middle of uh, developing the monitoring and evaluation framework for the decade. And therefore, uh, also from today's presentations, I, I realized that there is probably need for even more uh, collaboration and exchanges. Um, given that the criteria, one of our criteria for the ME framework is to use what is already existing, it's not surprising that we are referring to what is already existing, and therefore that, that is the common link. But I, I think there is definitely more scope to, to increase these exchanges to, to avoid application and eventually also to, to avoid the burden of uh, reporting and so on. So um, it's not so much of an answer, it's more of a, a point, uh, yeah, for, for food for thought of how we could do that. But we so there's a lot of information there, but still also the need to develop new indicators as well. And, and, and good coordination will be essential to really serve uh, to provide parties and organizations with information and to, to really track where we are, if we are taking the right decisions and moving in the direction that we want. Uh, this includes uh, uh, this element of, of uh, inclusiveness. So I'll give the floor to Kim. Yeah, thanks, Ezekiel. I think um, from what I'm hearing and, and from what I thought about coming to this meeting, to actualize the goals and objectives of the convention, we must think about getting the lion's share of our investment down to the ground, to the water level, so local actors can be more included. We get more of their voices. As Nick said, we promote and stimulate their involvement because that's where the change really happening. At intermediate levels, it's more about synergies, piggybacking current investment, and for global signal, we need to invest, but we mustn't let the need for a global headline indicator de derail the local action, because that would just be the tail wagging the dog. As we know, monitoring is for adapting local management on the water. Global reporting is a secondary bonus, which uh, offers the community to come together around common visions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Yes, this is an essential element for this transformation or change that we need in the whole framework to engage with people, to use information to really impact on decision making and these changes in behavior, in particular for, for marine and coastal biodiversity. Now I'll give the floor to Nancy, last speaker. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, I would want to comment on something that already uh, other presenters have commented on, and that is on coordination. I just wanted probably as a point um, to add on what they've already mentioned is that uh, under UNEP, we have a new initiative called uh, GEMS Oceans, which uh, is building on the World Environment Situation Room. Um, and this is not really to create new data or to um, create um, another avenue for collecting data, but then using the existing information that is collected either from the, the SDGs or what the MEAs are collecting, and, use, and um, using that data to manipulate and create products that would be um, resourceful when it comes to uh, decision making and policy and all that. So, um, it, so in terms of coordination or working um, across the MEAs and, and other organizations, yes, there is an, a, a platform for Oceans that is currently being developed. And I think um, if you go to the UNAP website or under uh, uh, James Oceans, you'll be able to read more on what is happening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nancy. As we can see, there's a lot of information and opportunities of collaboration at the global level, 
at the regional level and how can this also be linked to national level sources to help us to build this monitoring framework um thank you to all panelists for all this interesting uh, presentation i hope were useful for for participants uh, colleagues we now have arrived at the end of this interesting webinar uh, i hope reach the objective to provide us with more elements to build our monitoring framework in particular for marine and coastal biodiversity it was a pleasure to be with you all and i invite you to continue attending this series of webinars in preparation for our meetings next march in geneva so this webinar is adjourned and thank you very much to all Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Thanks all. Nice to speak with you all.